Um, so, so judging by how many of, the, of you there are, um, I think probably a lot of you <laughs> have had problems with microservices testing and, and would like to know how to avoid those problems in, in future. Um, hands up if you have had slightly painful experiences with microservices testing. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that's almost all of you. Hands up if you haven't done any microservices testing. One. Hands up if you haven't done any microservices testing but have a guilty feeling that you probably should have been doing microservices testing but forgot. <laughs> yeah. We got one brave man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm Holly Cummins. Um, I also have done microservices testing and had slightly painful experiences with microservices testing. And uh, one of my first experiences with microservices testing was I was working as a consultant um, and I was sort of doing firefighting. So I was, in, you know, it was sort of one of those senior roles where when a project got really, really bad, I'd get on the plane and then I'd sort of get off the plane to kind of see what was going on. And I got off the plane and pretty much the first thing they said to me was, every time we touch one microservice, all the others break. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of funny. I'm sure that's not what it says in all the articles telling you how microservices are going to solve your problems. It doesn't say, and you're going to end up with this system where every time you do anything, everything breaks. Were they in the cloud? Uh, they were in the cloud, yeah. So the, the cloud should have fixed all their problems, even if the microservices didn't fix all their problems. And so then the sort of the, the question is, okay, this is bad. What's going on? How do we fix it? And it seems like the the logical thing that we should have done to fix it is just add more and more end-to-end -end testing. But that's not necessarily as easy as you would think. Yeah, so I'm Eric D'Andrea. I work for Red Hat as well. But before I worked for Red Hat, I worked in financial services, insurance, and whatnot. And does this quote sound familiar to anybody? Like, who has agile, 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 but the time you get to testing and deploy your stuff is you have to do it by a schedule, which is waterfall, right? Oh, I, if I want to make this month's release, I have to have all my stuff in an environment by the sixth Friday of every 13th month in order to, to make the release cycle, right? So, you know, how expensive is that? There is no sixth Tuesday. There's no 13th month, but... You know that that's how that's how we operated. Yeah, and I think it's partly because end-to-end -end testing. Your is mic so, is gone. My mic is gone. Um, because end-to-end. -end... <coughs> Yay! <laughs> nope. No, no, her mic is gone. Okay. Ah, I see. We were okay. So because end-to-end -end testing is so expensive, you have to try and get like all the teams aligned around it, because <laughs> otherwise it's expensive. So before we start, um, I we have both done. Nope. <laughs> I always suspected he had cooties, and now, now I'm going to keep my distance. Um, no, no it's, it's, it's oh, it's the speaker. Is it your speaker? Thank you. <laughs> so this is the end-to-end -end testing. <laughs> In production. In production. <laughs> Whoa, oh dear. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> so I think what we've, what we've just seen now is, is where having two components makes it harder. And if there was just one, it would have worked. But because there was two, you get these unexpected interactions with the larger system as well. Um, so definitely, when we talk about testing, I'm, I'm a software engineer. Eric is a software engineer. I am not a professional tester. Um, so I always sort of feel a little bit like you know, a bit like yesterday with the imposter syndrome, you know, of like, is it okay for me to talk about testing because this isn't what I do? Um, but actually, it is what I do because all of us as software engineers should be doing testing. We have a responsibility to be testing. It is totally our job. Um, but it turns out it's kind of a hard job when it comes to, to microservices. And in a way, actually, I sometimes wish it wasn't my job when I'm doing the microservices testing because like... I'd rather be writing the code than trying to fight a test that's really hard. And, but the thing is, like, ultimately, with microservices, you have to test them, and, and you have to test them in, in a different way, because microservices testing is hard. So this is the 
Netflix architecture. Twitter has something similar. And what you can see is there's hundreds and hundreds of microservices. It's a slightly traumatic um, diagram to look at. And um, there's some unpleasant sort of side effects that you, you get there. Um, and and <laughs> underneath here, you can see that the topology is kind of nonlinear, but then the overall effect ends up being just quite terrifying. And then you get into the, you know, you thought you had a microservices architecture and actually <laughs> you have something quite, quite different. It must destroy it, otherwise it'll kill us. Yeah. <laughs> so then the question is, do microservices solve all problems? Um, hands up, <laughs> anybody who thinks microservices solve all problems? No, completely not. Um, hands up, who thinks microservices create more problems than they solve? A couple of hands. Hands up, who thinks they sort of, they give and then they take away and you kind of have the trade-offs? Yeah, yeah, I think completely. Um, and certainly, you know, what definitely is true with microservices is like a couple of years ago when I was a consultant, I, I would sort of go visit someone and they'd say, right, what we, what we need to do is we need to go to microservices. Well, why? What problem are we solving? Well, the problem we're solving is that we don't have enough microservices. No, no, you, you have to have an actual problem that you're, you're solving because there is definitely a cost to microservices. So this, I think, is a typical microservices system um, and they have lots of tentacles. The tentacles touch other things and then that's why, you know, you, testing it independently becomes really challenging. Um, and it, it's the dynamics of the system that I think it kind of looks bad there, but then when you see it actually in action, it's significantly, significantly worse. I love that picture. <laughs> But it kind of goes to Han Solo's life, right? He he tries to take shortcuts all the time. He gets himself into trouble. But in this you know, instance, it kind of bailed him out because it ate his enemies. Right? Yeah. Okay, and it's it's the trade off, you know. You sort of you <laughs> you have a Rathtar roaming around your ship, but you do solve some technical problems as well. <laughs> and I think with microservices. What a lot of us imagine and what we sort of, you know, read in the microservices are great article is that testing microservices is going to be really easy because each individual service is so small and everything is decoupled. So you just have to test these services. But if you only test the, these points and you don't test what's going on on the lines between them, do you actually know whether the thing works and yeah it's you sort of have this thing where you imagine that you just have to think about the points but I, because it's decoupled but there is actually no such thing as decoupled and Certainly, we sometimes think that because distributed and decoupled both start with D, if we make a distributed system, we have automatically made a decoupled system. But that's just, that's not true. And I, I read a really good article from Kent Beck a couple of years ago, and he was talking about how with, with decoupling, you can't, you know, you can't have something that's completely decoupled because it's a system. In a system, things have to interact, otherwise nothing happens. Um, so what you have to do instead is you have to manage the coupling and, you know, have coupling in some places and then maybe try and minimize your coupling in other places. And in order to do that, before you can manage it, you have to understand it. And sometimes you get unexpected sources of coupling too. So like here, we have these sort of, the, in the pod racer, we have the... Um, the cables, but then we have a kind of a different kind of coupling, which is which is that electrolink. Um, and again, you can see, like, if you think about the pod racer, and if you imagine what would happen if we decoupled this system. So, for example, if I removed that link, then we would no longer actually have a system. We would have like something that was kind of going like that, and you couldn't actually drive it. So you need that coupling, but you need to know what's going on. And I think the problem happens when we don't know what's going on. Um, so you, you think you know where the coupling is, but you forgot some of the sources of coupling. And of course, this is, you know, I'm sure 
what Kriya was talking about in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic to the Sith Lords when she said, it is all that is left unsaid upon which tragedies are built. That's my favorite one of the series. Yeah, I, th I think that movie might have got unse left unseen as well as left unsaid. So when we sort of have this problem where we don't really understand what the coupling is, what we sometimes try and do is say, I know what to do. I'm going to write it down. And the more I write down, the more successful I'm going to be. So when I, when I um, started my software engineering career about 20 years ago, on my first project, we had design documents. And we had a 500-page design document for a project with a team of about 20 people. And I was looking at this like 500-page design document thinking, is this... Is this quite right? This doesn't seem quite right to me, but you know, I'm new in my career. Maybe this is how it's supposed to work. Um, but clearly this is actually, and we now all know, this is not how you should do it. Because there was two problems with this. One is we spent so much time writing this 500 page design document and like arguing with each other about spelling and all of this like ridiculous bike shedding. But the other thing is we put everything into this design document. And on my first day of coding against the API, it was already wrong. So this document, it was just a pack of lies. And I think all design documents are actually at least somewhat lies. And you know, even if someone tells you what the protocol looks like, they may not be right, they might be confused, or it, it could be out of date. So really, like, what you have to do is, you know, documentation is good, but you have to rely on trying these things out. You have to actually do it in practice. You have to do it with the, the system to see how it behaves rather than relying on the theory. That's kind of expensive, though. Yeah, that's, that, that's the problem. That's where we get back to this sort of, you know, end-to-end -end testing that you, if you don't do it, you don't know what the system does, but if you do do it... It's really, really expensive. All right. So what do we do? That's well, why we're here, right? Yeah. That's why yeah. everybody here is in the room. It's like, well, just get to the meat of this already, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's, I mean, the first thing that we have to do fundamentally is we have to do testing. We have, and, you know, we don't want to be doing manual testing because then you get back into that, okay, we've sent it over to QE and we've thrown it over the wall and we do it, you know, really rarely and there's this huge cycle. So we've got to have the automated testing. And as a way of thinking about how you break down your, your automated tests, I find the test pyramid really useful. Um, so who here is familiar with the test pyramid? Most. Yeah, mo most of you. Yeah, cool. So some people argue about it and say it should be like a test trophy or like a test whatever. But I think this is sort of a good starting point for the conversation. So at the top of your test pyramid, you have the end-to-end -end tests. They're really realistic, so they're really useful. At the bottom of your test pyramid, you have unit tests. Um, they are so delightfully cheap to write. And they are, well, they have a problem, but we'll come back to that. And then usually in the middle, as a kind of a compromise between the two, you have the integration tests where you're connecting just a couple of components. Yeah, and I always find that term integration is very loose. Yeah, I get confused about that. So yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that because like, with with integration tests, especially now, like it used to be that you kind of knew what an integration test was, but certainly Spring, I think, really changed what would be in the unit test layer and, and what counted as an integration test. And, you, you know, now Quarkus have, have something similar where you have these tests that run really fast, but they're definitely not a unit test. They're connecting multiple things together. So, you know, you can test with your database or, you know, you can test with your application server or, or framework or, or whatever you have. But the problem with end-to-end -end tests, as we said, is that they are so expensive. The problem with unit tests is because you're testing something in isolation, you have to use stubs or fakes or whatever else to try and mock out the dependencies. But then we get a problem. Because when we do a mock, we have a conversation with the other person, or we read their lying design document to say, how does this work? After spending a weekend reading it. Yeah. 
And then we write something that we think looks exa like, exactly like what they said it looks like. And we run our tests, and the tests pass, and everything is good. Mm -hmm. Yay. Yeah. The only problem is that their actual code doesn't look like what we thought it did, either because they lied to us or because we got confused. So even though the tests are passing, reality, reality is broken. And, and fundamentally, the problem is that mocks are never perfect. It may kind of look okay for a bit, but then as soon as you poke it in more detail, you discover that it's, you know, if it's a storm too poor, it's too short, or, you know, it, it behaves differently in this circumstance. And if you spent so much time making your mock perfect, you still wouldn't be perfect. And you would have just spent like all this time that you could have been spending for something else. And sometimes somebody realizes it's just not the right thing. Yeah. And, you know, so it, it gets you part of the way, but then eventually... You end up in the garbage. Yeah, you're, you're, you're going to end up in trouble. Um, so you may think, oh, actually, no, all my mocks are perfect. This, you know, <laughs> I've never had a problem. Well, let's look at like a little problem with, with the limitations of unit tests. Um, and yep. we've been talking about wikis. And Wookiees look a bit like carpets. So let's see what we could do. Yep. So who here has been in a position where all your unit tests on both your services are green, you deploy them, and all hell breaks loose because they just don't work with each other, right? And when we came up with this example, Holly and I had a conversation like, is this too trivial? And she's like, oh, no, this is this is something that actually happens <laughs> yeah, in reality. I, I was so like, this would never happen on my watch, but... <laughs> It, that's because Eric's perfect. That's right. That's right. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to start up the services here. So let's go start everything up here. Should have done this beforehand, but Eric's not perfect. I'm not perfect. I take it back. <laughs> yeah. So got to start up a couple services. And I think what this is sort of showing already is like why microservice testing is annoying because here you know we're just going to show you our system and before eric can do anything he has to start up a whole bunch of services even for this trivial little system with four services so imagine if we were trying to show you the netflix architecture running on our laptop all right so we've got our wookie copper ca carpet shop so i'm going to order a brown carpet and i see oh, i guess i didn't start them all up huh ah, you've got some yeah, services we've got some some other thing i gotta start up a whole bunch of other stuff too here all right, so now we'll start up uh, our third service. Let's try it again. Up, oh, we still got an error here. Oh, we got another service. We got my microservices is hard. So the idea here is that someone can go and they want to buy a Wookiee carpet because they were inspired by Princess Leia. So the first thing they do is they go to a BFF, and then they go to someone who knits a carpet, and then. Eventually, once we've got all the services going, they get to someone who shaves the Wookiee to get the Wookiee fur to turn into the carpet. Yep. So we've got a, uh, someone who's shaving the Wookiees. And oh, this person actually survived. Everybody ever try to shave a Wookiee before? <laughs> it's not a, a pleasant experience. Sometimes you don't survive. So um, in this case, the, the person who shaved the, the Wookiee survived. And we got our nice brown carpet. Woohoo. But... If you haven't guessed, I'm not from the UK. Based on my accent, I'm actually from the US. This color just looks wrong to me. Right? It's it's not how you should spell color. It's so how you should spell color. It's not right. So we're just gonna fix that. Right? <laughs> what, what could possibly go what wrong? Could possibly go wrong here, right? And you can see on my service that we're using Quarkus with continuous testing. All my tests have passed, so it, it's it's running all the tests in the background. So I can just use my fancy little oops, fancy little IDE here. This happened the last time. Like my keystrokes stopped working in the middle of a demo. I'm just gonna change it to how it should be. Yep, it already picked up my tests. It's everything is green. All my tests pass. On my the other side, I'll, I didn't touch anything, so everything is running good. So let's let's do another brown carpet here. And I got a totally indescribable carpet I did with a sad wiki here. So what happened? So the color comes in, but when it sends it back over there, you can see the colors changed, but because we didn't touch the other service, 
it's now broken, null, and so it, it's affecting the total of the rest of the server. So all my unit tests are green, but yet my service is now, my system as a whole is now busted. So how do we fix that? And, and the reason the tests are green is because we were using Jackson to serialize and deserialize. So our IDE refactoring changed our types, but yep. that caused problems. Yeah, you can see right here because we're using Java and Java, you made the, the IDE did the refactoring, it renamed the method and Jackson just happily marshals it. So our unit test here, you know, the method got refactored and my test is still green, but yet now my system as a whole is broke. So let's fix that. Or let's talk about it a little bit. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Cool. So how do we how do we fix this? Um, one thing you could do is you could like write lots more things down in your unit tests to say no, no, it's got to be spelled the UK way. But then you that still doesn't actually give you any confidence that what's at the other end. Do they expect the UK spelling? Do they do they Ameri expect the American spelling? So we you know we need something that's not just hard coding more because that's a bit like writing a design document more. The right spelling. <laughs> and I think it's sort of like one one way to sort of think about it is when you think about how you would test a fire alarm. <clears throat> Sorry. I <laughs> no, I had to cough. <laughs> So if I wanted to test my fire alarm to give me the maximum, maximum confidence, if I had a house, I would set my house on fire. If I had a Death Star, I would blow up my Death Star. And then, you know, you sort of, as the Death Star is burning, you know, you hear this beep, 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 beep from the Death Star. And, you know, one captain says, sir, we have proved that the fire alarm in the Death Star works. And the other one goes, and you know, Darth Vader goes, yes, but we have no Death Star. That's unfortunate. Um, you kind of hope that they test a fire alarm at least once this way, maybe not with a Death Star, but with a house. Um, but you're not going to like every week test your fire alarm by blowing up your house because it's just too expensive. Um, so instead, what you can do with a fire alarm, so this is actually now a fire alarm, even though it looks like a Death Star. Um, fire alarm anticipated the need to test it. And what you can do is a fire alarm is instrumented to allow for unit testing. And there's that little button. And if you push that button, you get beep, beep, beep. The okay. problem is that that doesn't necessarily give me that much confidence that if I had an actual fire, <laughs> yeah, like fire doesn't have fingers. The fire is not going to come in and push the button. What I want to know is that if there's smoke, the fire alarm goes off. And I don't know about you, but every now and then, like I set something on fire when I'm cooking by accident and there's like smoke coming up and there's like flame and the fire alarm's going nothing to see here and I'm like what so you know you kind of want to know that if there was an actual actual fire it works so how many of you know what this is yeah two people four people have raised their hands and the rest of you are looking at it really confused so you don't get these in houses but you do get them in institutions and and what it is, is it's like sort of a long stick and then it's got this little cup and then they sort of wrap the cup around the fire alarm and it goes poof and puts in a little smoke and then the fire alarm goes beep, beep, beep. So you get that. It's not the same as setting your house on fire, but you do know that smoke makes it go beep, which is what you really care about. So it's kind of, you know, it's like contract testing a fire alarm. It's not an end to end test, but it's a lot better than a unit test. And hopefully they told everybody inside that it was a test. Yeah, that, that too. Um, if on the other hand, you did actually, when we were looking for pictures of burning Death Stars, it turns out you can buy a Death Star fire pit. So if any of you are very into barbecue and Star Wars and have $3,000, then <laughs> don't say you got nothing out of the talk. So when we go back to the, to the test pyramid, um, I'm being a bit lazy here. And so contract tests basically fit around the same level as integration tests, but they kind of give you more confidence than integration tests. So I've put them above, but they actually have a cost pretty similar to unit tests. So I could have put them below. So what a contract test is doing really is it's like a better mock. So we've got our code and their code, and then we have something in between that for our code acts like as a mock, acts like a mock, but for their code, it acts like a functional test. So what that means is that if the tests are passing, we've got a pretty good idea that reality is okay as well. 
And if, on the other hand, something goes wrong and the implementation on, of the provider isn't what it's supposed to be, then we get their tests fail. So that is good. And if we screw it up? <laughs> um, so there's a couple of different ways to do contract testing. Um, what we're going to show you is what's probably the sort of de facto standard contract testing framework, which is PACT. Um, so, you know, PACT really can help solve these situations. All right. So let's go back to our demo here. How do we fix or how do we not just fix, how do we prevent that from happening? All right. All right. So I'll go back to our system here. So how would we fix what we did? So we've got actually th the last time we did this because we're going to flip back and forth between what we call the provider and the consumer. So there's always two sides of, you know, whenever you have some kind of shared resource, you've got the person producing it and the person consuming it. Well, in this case with PACT, it's the consumer who's driving the development of the contract. So we actually have two different hats. So rather than, you know, because we have one laptop and we're coding both. So I'm going to be the consumer here. And Holly's going to be the provider here, just to eliminate confusion. So, yeah, especially consumer provider. Yeah, because in the demo, there's like a chain of four things, but like we're just looking at two of them. So then it gets confusing about who's consumer and who's provider. So, here, no more confusion, right? So I'm going to go into my test. So pretty standard stuff. You know, when we're making a this class makes a REST call to the provider here, and we've mocked out the 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 call to the provider. So what we're going to do is we're just going to remove the mock here. And then up at the test, I'm going to add a few annotations, which bring in the pack testing framework. And it says that this is going to be a test for the provider of, we call it the Wookie Tamer, is the, the person doing, doing the shaving. And the Wookie Tamer is going to run on, on port 8096. But now you notice some other stuff is already starting to break. So we're going to remove our mock. And then I'm going to add in. Oops. If it's going to work. And so here we're sort of there setting we up a mock, but we're just using Pact to set up the mock instead of using Mokito or whatever we were using before. Yeah. And now, even though I've done this probably a million times, IntelliJ still can't figure out what it is that I'm trying to do. <laughs> so I need to resolve some imports here. Import, import, import. Here we go. All right. So now we have a contract and I'll go over it in a second. And we got to bind our contract to it. Oops, wrong thing. So this is saying which behavior that I declared I expect is this test testing. Jeez, it's, it's not not working here. Let's, it's the miracle of live demos. Yeah, live audience-driven development, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, what's what's going on? My my, you know, you try as a presenter and a demo person, you set up all this like automation ahead of time, and then it just actually doesn't work when you <laughs> when you start to do it here. And you'll notice that the rest of the test is the same. So, like here, yeah. we're not trying to test the Wookie Tamer. We're trying to define a mock Wookie Tamer so that we can test our code. Which there is we go. we're sort of checking what the knitter is doing. There we go. So so we have a con so we're defining the contract. I'm gonna look this way to just so I can point. We're saying that I have a body that looks like I have some string that has the color spelled the right or what you would consider the right way. I've got a body here, and then I'm saying that hey, when I receive a request for this fur, given this HTTP path with a post, I expect an okay status with a body that kind of looks like that. And now I have my test, which assert does the assertion. So what PAC does on, on the backside is it actually stands up a mock server, which is going to serve the requests that match the contract that I specified. So now I can write a test that when I actually make the call, rather than just going to some you know in-memory mock that's going to return some canned data, it's actually making the request to the mock server that PACT has, has stood up for me. 
And so now you can see the tests are already passing, right? So it's already, so now my tests pass, woohoo, on the on the provide or on the, the consumer side. And so now I'm going to the other kind of cool thing with Pact is it comes with this broker. So one of the common things is how do you share, because it's a shared resource, how do you share the contract between the two sides? Now you could check it into GitHub, you could put it in the file system, there's a bunch of different ways. But Pact has this concept of a, a broker. So the consumer can publish the contracts to the broker and the providers can then read the contracts, you know, live or through webhooks or whatever. There's a lot of different ways. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to publish the contract to a broker. And if I go show you the broker, so we're using the, there's an open source SAS, that was weird, open source SAS model for this. And you can see there's a consumer contract here. The, the provider hasn't been verified by any providers yet because I just published it. But if I look at the contract, it kind of says exactly what I showed you in code, but now the contract is is there. And now Holly's gonna take over and fix, and I'll stand here and hold your mic yeah. for you. <laughs> so I drew the short straw, because I'm the Wookiee tamer, um, and I have to try and shave a Wookiee. So, and it's worse than that. I have to try and shave a Wookiee on a laptop that's not mine. Go one more, there you go. Yeah, okay, cool. So what I've got here is I've got the fur resource test, um, but I want to make another test. So I'm going to do a new class and I'm going to... I think to... that's going to create a class inside the cl other class. <laughs> other, someone else's laptop. I would have been totally fine and I wouldn't have made that mistake on my laptop. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to call it a fur resource yeah. contract verification tests. And it lives in the tests, which is good. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of all of this. And I'm going to do the oops, the live template. So you can see there's not much here. Um, it's using a test template. So it's just saying, Pact, can you please go read the contract from the broker? I am a Wookiee tamer. Here's where you can find my Quarkus instance on this port and then just go and run the tests. So I'm kind of getting, as the provider, I'm getting some functional tests for free. So now if I run these, what I should find... It's already running. Oh, it's already running. So you can see it's run and it's red, which is really good because reality is broken because I'm still calling it color. So what I can do now is I can go back and I can do Eric, undo Eric's vandalism. And <laughs> I can here, I can go and I can change color. And so I can refactor that. And I can add in the correct U. And then I can refactor. And then... It's already picked it up and running. Yep, it's running. There we go. And so my tests are green. And if I go to my broker as well, then I should be able to see that the broker has updated. So if I was like a project manager or someone who wanted to sort of monitor the overall health of the system, I could use the broker to see if things are working together and we won't show it, but you could use versions as well to say, okay, this version of the microservice works together, but the previous version that Eric ruined doesn't work. So I need to not those deploy those together. Cool. Cool. All right. Let's move on. <laughs> So, whoops, that was not what I intended to do. What'd you do? You broke my laptop. <laughs> I totally broke your laptop. <laughs> so one thing that you might have noticed in that demo is that as soon as the consumer, Eric, wrote those tests, me as the provider, my tests were broken, but I hadn't even, I mean, I, I did actually write the test because I started using the, the contract. But if Eric then went back and said, actually, no, I don't want it to be color. I want it to be chroma or something. Um, then as the provider, my tests would start breaking, even though I didn't really 
you know, expect it to be chroma. Um, so that can be sort of surprising for some people. Um, it definitely does mean that you need to have that dialogue between the consumer and the provider about what the expectations are rather than the consumer just kind of randomly going, hey, and I would like these 62 new features. I'm going to write a contract test. Um, but in general, this pattern where the consumer writes the tests first and then shares them to the provider is known as consumer-driven contract testing. So the sort of the, the flow that we showed is that you start with the consumer and the consumer writes some tests and in those tests they then declare a pact which generates a contract and then that contract is used as a mock for the tests. And then the provider comes in later and then with a provider, they use the contract to verify if they have contract tests. So this has some big advantages. We haven't really shown it, but you can get some quite rich sort of semantic functional tests. Um, and another thing that's really good is that it means on the provider side, they can develop to the test. So I don't need to, as a provider, add a whole bunch of features just in case someone wants them. I only have to do what's actually being used. So it's a, it gives really good Yagni, you ain't gonna need it if you wanna develop in that way. Um, there are some disadvantages as well. So, you know, if you're already generating open API, you now have two artifacts for your spec. You've got the open API spec and the contract test. Um, and as a provider, I do have to have a relationship to my consumers. So I need my consumers to give me tests. If I'm writing a service that's used by hundreds of people on the internet, this probably isn't going to work because I'm not going to have that relationship. I'm building the weather service. and I want it to be sunny on Friday <laughs> in London. Good luck with that. <laughs> There's no amount of contract testing that will fix that. Um, and, you know, as we mentioned as well, you do have to have a bit of a, a trust relationship because the consumers can break the provider's CI. So they have to not just go and randomly do things without talking. So I mentioned that, you know, if, you are, if you're already using Swagger, this is, you know, maybe a, a problem um, or you maybe want to reuse that. And there certainly are some cases where PACT isn't the best choice. So an alternate way of doing contract testing is to do it what's called provider-driven contract testing. And this is more suited to ones where you're, you have a lot of consumers and you don't necessarily talk to them. So here you start with the provider. You hope that someday you may have consumers, but you don't really know. Um, you generate your, your contract just as an open API snapshot of your current implementation. And then you can verify that your provider matches the contract, which is pretty easy because you just generated it. Um, so usually, you know, this is kind of just making sure that you don't have a regression. So it's a less deep test here. And then eventually, hopefully you get a consumer. And then what you can do is you can use tools like um, Prism or like Microx to use your, generate a mock from your open API spec. And then that, it has a big advantage, which is that the open API format is familiar. Um, and another advantage is as the provider, I totally don't need to know who my consumers are. I don't need to talk to them. They can't break me. Um, but on the other hand, as a provider, I don't actually have any idea who's using my API or how, which might be depressing. And as well, as a provider, if I want to remove an endpoint, I have no idea if it's being used or not, so I can't remove it. Whereas if I have consumer-driven contract tests, I can say, you know what, I wrote this endpoint, no one's using it, it's a maintenance headache, I can safely get rid of it because I know what's actually being used. Um, another problem with this sort of model is you can usually, you can test the syntax, you can, you can catch problems like color, color, but you can't really get sort of a more of a functional test of like, okay, here's how I actually expect you to behave, not beyond just the type safety. Um, and I think, it, you know, it's sort of, you end up in this situation where sometimes you have services where the syntax is the same, but the semantics are different, which is basically saying it looks the same, but because the behavior is different, the system's still going to be broken and open API totally wouldn't catch that. So like in this case, what we have is, you know, it looks like a stormtrooper, but 
it behaves like Luke. But if you had open API stormtrooper verification, that verification would pass. So let's see what that looks like when we actually do it. And hopefully we can finish before we run out of time. So let's go back to our system here. So anybody know what color Wookiees are available or naturally? Brown, right? We got brown Wookiees, white Wookiees? White Wookiees exist? Come on, you should all know this. <laughs> Black Wookiees? Black Wookiees? Black Wookiees, yeah. How about pink? They're pink Wookiees? Doesn't sound unreasonable if I wanted a pink carpet, right? You know, we have dyeing and, and whatnot to be able to do that. So let, let's order, uh, an, I want a nice pink. Oh, can we try black first? Sorry. Can we what? Can we try a black carpet? A black carpet? Yeah, yeah. we can try a black carpet. Just to show that we haven't hard coded it. Yes, we have black carpets. We got a nice black carpet we did. I can ask for a white carpet. Yeah, I got a nice white carpet. What about a pink carpet? But I got a brown carpet. So I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> it's so a who's, very nice brown carpet. So who's who? who I couldn't find a pink Wookie. So whose job should it be? You know, if we, if we need to bring in some kind, of, so we just kind of discover we need some kind of way to dye fur, right? So whose job is it? Is it the person shaving the Wookie? I mean, they're barely escaping with their life. I don't know that I want to ask them to do. <laughs> I found a Wookie. I couldn't find the right Wookie, so I gave you a Wookie. I did my job. Yep. So we asked for a pink one, and we got a brown one back. So so how could we how could we fix this? So let's go back to our test. And so we have a test already for kind of generically saying, if I have a color, this example is brown, that just means what the mock server is gonna return to me. It's just, I don't really care what the value is. It's just, I have a value that looks like this. But what if we need to get more specific? And this kind of goes to the, to the semantics a little bit. So if I add a contract in here, that it looks very similar, but it basically says, so instead of any string, that I actually, the value actually should be pink. And in that case, my service should return a 404 not found. So we're talking about like, like you had mentioned with open API, we haven't touched the, the, um, the schema or the syntax. So from a type safety perspective, it looks exactly the same, but it's what's inside that's different that changes the behavior. And this is totally something that open API would not be able to, to do for you. So now once we add that, we can add the, um, the test for it. So we have to add a test. So now I'm not going to get into HTTP status codes, but essentially we've written a test that says if I ask for a pink carpet from the provider, and I get a pink carpet, then my service is just going to return a 418. Who knows what 418 is? Anybody know from the HTTP? It was actually an April Fool's Day yeah. joke many, many, many years ago. It's, I'm a teapot. You use that one all the time, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, we chose 418 for the demo to try and, because it gets, again, like it gets really confusing with the chain of like, who's doing what and who's verifying what. And so we chose 418 because it's something that you would never use. Um, which I thought made it clearer and I think actually makes it more confusing. So yeah. apologies for that. Yeah. But, but it's once got I, teapots. But once I do that, actually my tests are now broken. So what happened here? I, the fact that my mock is returning a 404, my test fails, so my service actually doesn't handle the 404 correctly. So now I got to kind of go fix that a little bit. So if I go into my, my service here, we're going to do what every good developer does is we're going to do a try catch around the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. All right, that, that's what everybody does. Catch, web application exception. I've got like a very limited typing space here and I'm gonna throw a new not found exception. And so here the testing is allowing us to discover problems with the, the consumer. So we thought, the consumer thought that if they just got a 404 back, everything would be okay, but actually the consumer isn't handling the 404 correctly. Yep. So now it is because we we're catching it and we're just now we're throwing a, a not found exception while my test pass. I can publish the contract, publish a version two of the contract because we've updated the contract. You can't just say, oh, I didn't like the way that contract looked. Let me just overwrite it, right? Once it's there, it's kind of there you know, as, as, a, as a version thing. So now that it's there, I can come back to my broker. If I come back and I refresh the broker, we should see now I've got a version two of the consumer, which actually hasn't been verified yet. And that's what you're gonna do. Yeah, so now... And I'll the, be your... Look. Hey, so the consumer is now handling the 404 properly, um, but 
the provider is still returning the fallback wiki. Because again, there was just you know a bit of a mis misunderstanding of like, when does an error happen and how do we handle the error? So as a provider, what I can do is on my fur resource, um, you can see there's, I'm, I'm already detecting the case where I couldn't find the right color and I catch that and I just return a fallback. But so instead, what I'm gonna do is like, you don't like my fallback, you want errors instead, okay. I will return null. And so with that, my job is done. High five. Except the test So normally um, Quarkus will detect what parts of your tests need to be rerun based on what code changed. Um, with Pact, because it does all this sort of really like under the covers JUnit stuff, Quarkus sometimes gets confused. So you sometimes have to manually rerun the tests, which you wouldn't normally. Um, so I've been writing a Quarkus Pact extension to, to start fixing some of those. And I've got it mostly working now, so continuous testing works. But there's a patch that fixes that, but it hasn't been in, made it into a release yet. So you can see, I, I thought I was returning, doing the right error handling because I was like returning null and saying I don't have a wiki, but the contract expected a 404 and my returning null because of how the rest spec works and, and Jack's RS is actually returning a 204. So we have like a few things that we could do here because yeah, we'd have to have a conversation, you know, two of the whole 204 versus 404 conversation. 404 is always the right answer, by the way, but, you know, <laughs> happy to meet you at the pub and explain why. But we'd have to actually have that conversation about what's the right thing to do, because somebody now has to change something. Either we've got to update the contract and everybody's got to kind of be in sync or we've got to do something else. But now we're we're all effectively broken, but we know we're broken. And so we know don't push the deploy button because <laughs> we're bo we're broken and sit the system as a whole in reality is going to be busted. Yeah, and so this is something, you know, that it's fairly easy to fix on either the provider or the consumer, but we just have to know that there's a problem so we can fix it. Um, and I mentioned that, you know, some of these things I've seen in the field, like correcting the typos, and the 204-404 thing as well. Um, I saw when I was preparing an earlier version of a packed demo, and I'd, I was working with Eric's code and I just changed it and then I got, I was expecting it to be a 404 and it was a 204. And so what I did, like any good developer, is I just went back and I changed my consumers to change the mock, which I thought would change, you know, if the mock, if, you're, if your consumer doesn't work with the mock, you change the mock and then everything is good. But of course, because it's not just a mock, it's connected to that contract, that then showed me that my change hadn't actually fixed the problem. Um, and then Eric started to lecture me about 204s and 404s. And at that point, I had a demo to do the next day, and it was like 11 p.m. And I was like, I don't care about 204s and 404s. I just want it to work. I just want my services to match reality. But then if the contract doesn't match reality, you know, all hell, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. And with um, no matter whether you're doing provider driven or consumer driven, I'd encourage you to do a style which is known as contract first. So that is that you instead of like starting with the implementation, you start with the contract. Um, and so that, you know, it's it's a really similar feel to TDD, but just at a slightly higher level. So if you're doing consumer driven contract testing, it's like TDD, but between teams. So you're actually sort of having that slightly bigger TDD loop. And if you're doing provider driven, you have the smaller TDD loop where it's just with yourself, but you still have that TDD loop. And so just to sort of wrap up with, with everything, um, microservices testing is hard. <laughs> there are a few glazed faces going, yes, microservices testing is hard. Um, you definitely do want to limit end-to-end -end testing because it's just too expensive and it's going to cause you too much pain. But mocks, they're not going to be enough on their own. You need something in between those two. And that's really where contract testing can save the day and rescue you. Um, if if you want to know more, um, Eric, about Quarkus, Eric has a Quarkus for Spring Developers book, and he did a signing, but that was yesterday, so I'm afraid you've totally missed out. Um, the slides are there, 
and I think we have we have passes oh, to yes. the party. Anybody yes, who wants to go to the party, you got to come. The party passes. Get some passes. Um, and I don't think we have time for questions, but we'll be sort of hanging around at the booth or in the hall or up here. And with that, thank you very much.